God, many children of God, they don't look at their homes to be a place that is as sacred as the church, the sanctuary. They have undervalued and they underestimated God's perspective and the heart for the home. Now God began human existence with marriage and family. The first community that he ever established was a family and a home. God had a relationship with man. And that relationship was in the context of family. He being our father and we being his children. Before setting up the church, there was family. The home and family is of critical importance. Now the Israelites didn't have a formal place of worship until the tabernacle of Moses. Before the tabernacle of Moses, the place of worship was the home. All worship was directed and led by the head of the home, the husband and the father of that family. Today, we know that there are many households that are led by a single parent. Most of the time, that is a woman. So if that would be the case, then the woman becomes the spiritual head of her home. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And what are we going to do with them? He commands us. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down. And when thou, thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. We have replaced the home with the church. For many Christians and their families, all exercise happens in church. All prayer that is ever done is in church. If there's to be any reading or studying of God's word, it's in church. If our children or us, for that matter, get any biblical teaching, it happens at church and not at home. There has been an abdication of responsibility for godly leadership, family worship, and spiritual discipleship. Parents have abdicated their place in all of this. You and I and our children are the products of our homes. A lot of times we fear terrorism. We fear crime or some dreaded disease, but yet many times we are too complacent when it comes to our families. How is your family doing today? Are there good relationships with love one towards another? Good understanding? Good companionship? Or is it filled with anger? Is it filled with yelling? With crying and desperation? Our families, if you haven't realized it by now, which I know you have, are under attack. But I say that it is time to reclaim our families completely for Jesus Christ. Initiate 
God, God's plan for our home, for our family. First of all, you've got to make a con conscious and conscientious decision. My home is going to be God's home. You've got to make that decision. You've got to make that. My home is going to be as blessed and blessed and sacred as the church. In Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua made a choice for his home. He was a spiritual head. God is a God of order. And his divine order is what works the best. It is Christ who is the head. And then the man comes right under Christ. And then under the man comes the woman. You hear me, women? I'm part we women kind of have a little hard time with. And then the children come under the mother, which comes under the father, which the father comes under Jesus Christ. This is God's order. And now, is somebody else going to have a better plan than he that is the creator that created us and created the family? No. He has the master plan for the family. But the reason a lot of families are dysfunctional is because
spiritual yet because your husband has not been born of the spirit. But you still have to make sure, even though sometimes he'll give you a lot of reasons when they're unsaved, not to respect them. But because of the example And that he is present 
in our home. And that he's listening to every conversation. We're going to teach them. Jesus is always with us. In this home, Jesus is always with us. And we need to throw away DVDs and 
destroy their marriage and destroy their homes and destroy their children. Too many families are under assault and they're falling apart. And we need to stop trying to patch things up in our family, are we? And do it his way. And the Bible way. We need to trust the Lord and believe that he has a solution to every problem that we are facing. We need to let Jesus back into our personal life, into every single situation in our life and decision. One thing that you see a lot in pastoring is that people in families, they will make their own decisions, of course, and they will decide to do something. And they may not have even prayed about it. You know, it sounded real good at the time. At the time, you know, didn't pray about it, but I felt good about it. And then the outcome may be a disaster. Then they come to God. Then they cry out to God. Then they come running to the pastor. They would have gone to God first. And they would have asked for God's guidance and God's counsel first. And then run it through and say, Pastor, I'm praying about this. Would you help me pray about this, Pastor? I haven't made a decision, but I, I, I will feel better if I know that my pastor's praying with me about it. If we, we need to do things right. It, it's going to take more than saying, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Right. Or I'm a child of God. To make your home Jesus' home. Right. There is a secular pressure on Christian homes today to compromise our spiritual values. Yes. And it is a strong onslaught. I truly believe that it is an attack that has been unleashed against everything Christian from the very pits of hell because Satan knows his time is running out. Read your newspaper. Get some more on the fence and get your Bible on the side. We are surrounded daily with opportunities to give greater worship to other things. To give worship to other people more than to God. I was. He is a jealous God. 
Oh, yes, it is. And he has to be number one or he won't be anything. That's the way, that's the way he works. I'm just letting you know that's the way he works. So we must strive to make Jesus the center of our life, the center of our heart, the center of our thoughts, and the center of our home. Make it the center of your marriage. You want a strong marriage? Make it the center of your marriage. Amen. Amen. And we need to train and we need to model before our children a genuine, sincere, and honest relationship with God in whatever happy or difficult situations that we face as a family. <laughs> Do you serve God at home the way you serve Him when you come to church? What do your children see in your life at home? Do they see one person when you come to church and then they see a different person at home? I pray that this is not the case because then what we do to our children is confuse them and we teach them how to be hypocrites. Nobody else. We teach them. You put on a face and you put on certain clothes and you act a certain way when you go to the house of God. But when you're in the street or you're at home or you're going to go to the park, you wear different clothes. You act a different way and you talk a different way and you act a different way. Too many children will never come to God because they are seeing a double way of thinking, a double way of living, a double way of dressing. They see mom and dad, oh yeah, I know. When they come to church, oh yeah. Sunday, put your dress, your Sunday clothes on. It's not the shorts. It's the dress. We are teaching our children. We are confusing and they will get to the point they will believe in no God. Amen. Or will live as agnostics, not denying God, but neither being convinced that there is a God. Whatever we want before our children, more times than not, they're going to use that pattern to live out their lives, either for good or bad. Every individual under the sound of my voice, you know how you are living for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how you're living your life for Him. Now let me ask you, as parents, those of you that are here that are parents, would you be happy and satisfied and content and at peace before God if your children grow up to serve God just the way you're serving Him right now? Would you be happy, content, and at peace with God if your children grow up to serve God just the way you're serving Him right now? Let me give you an example of how important it is to be parents that are in touch with God and are spiritual and they talk to God and God talks to them. There was a couple in ministry, in ministry many, many years, pastoring, missionary work, I mean the whole service for the Lord. And the parents knew that their son was not where he was supposed to be with God. He was going through those rebellious years, teenage years. He had made friends that were not a good influence. They knew it. The parents knew it. The mother was praying. Praying for her, her son. Oh God, protect my son. Put a hedge of protection around him. Oh Lord, he's not doing right. He's, I know he's not living, but please protect him, Lord. And one day this mother, in prayer, while she was in prayer, that's why prayerful mothers are very important. She got up from her prayer because God 
made her feel restless. Now, I didn't hear this story as far as from way far away or reading the book. This mother told me the story. And she did something she had never done. She began to go through her son's Chester drawers. And she kept asking, Lord, what am I looking for? But she, she was impulsed by the Holy Ghost. What am I looking for? One drawer, another drawer. She left the Chester drawer outside, didn't finish all of them. Looked under the, between the mattress and the box spring. She was hunting, went in the closet. What am I looking for? What am I looking for? Went back to the Chester drawer. Started her about the third one. Because she that's where she left off. She put her hand way back underneath all the stuff. Feel it. She found a little plastic, little plastic zip on the back. Had drugs in it. That mother, of course, was, oh, Lord, he's into drugs. And so she took it to her husband, and they prayed together, asking God to give them the wisdom of how to present all of this to their son. In a way that he would not prevail, but that God would touch his heart, and he would repent and be broken before. And this is exactly what they did. And when they showed him what mother had found, he broke down and he wept. And he said, I just want y'all to believe me. I am not heavy into drugs. This is the first of it that I got somewhere. And God, because of a sensitive mother, of a mother that was in contact with God, down in prayer for her son, she knew he wasn't right. The Holy Ghost in her quickened her. And that young man today is a preacher of the gospel. Another mother, almost the same, almost the same, except this other mother was not down praying. It was a Saturday when usually mothers get to sleep in because the kids, they don't have to send them to school. <laughs> she woke up, her husband was still asleep, her children were still asleep. Pray for him. 
and today he is a preacher of the gospel, a pastor. Yeah, but she's your wife. 
to this chick. She's not All right. So then, Isaac, who is Abraham's son, yes. the second generation. Can you believe? Yeah, I can. Because his father modeled it. He showed him the way. Use the very same lie as his father. Are they looking at us? Are our children looking at us? Are our children listening to us? Where did Isaac learn the lie? From his father. He also said that Rebecca was his sister. Then Jacob, the third generation, Jacob lies also. And he deceived his father. He lied to his father. And he passed for Esau because he wanted the birthright. He wanted the blessing. And the firstborn was supposed to get the blessing. And so he conspires with his mother. And he goes into the tent where his father is that is getting ready to die. And so he wants to give the birthright blessing to Esau. Yeah. And he lies to his father. And his father gives him the birthright blessing. That mother paid a price. Be careful. Be careful. That mother paid a price. For having conspired with her son to lie to her husband. Do you know that Isaac was, Re was Rebecca's favorite son of the two? And do you know that because Esau became so furious that he wanted to kill his brother after he found out what happened? That Esau, uh, excuse me, Isaac had to run. saw her favorite son again until she died. She never saw him again. When you do things the wrong way, even if you think it's for something good, God is not with you. And you will have to pay a price. Then Jacob's fourth generation, he says, remember what the Bible says? that the curse will, from the father will follow the children to the 34th generation? Fourth generation. Jacob has 12 sons. And what did they do? They killed his, they, well, they wanted to kill out of jealousy Jacob's favorite son, Joseph. But that God wasn't going to allow that to happen because he had a purpose and a plan for Joseph. But they lied to him and they went back and said, oh, they took his coat and put a favorite coat that his father had given him and they stained it with animal's blood and they said, oh, uh, an animal came and, and he killed him and he devoured him. A wild animal killed Joseph. So you see what you model in front of your kids? It'll follow the next generation and the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. But it does it can stop with you. Maybe you were not raised in the church, or maybe you were raised in the church, but there was something that your parents did not correct in their life, and you saw it. You have now the opportunity to choose to make it stop with your generation. And not let your kids have to struggle through these things that we pass on to them in our relationship with God. It's really sad, but what we don't correct in our lives, we will pass it on to our children. That's the way it works. So we've got to strike a model of godly principles, godly values in our home. Living this way will bring blessing. If I asked you all, do you want God's blessing on your home? You all are going to tell me yes. Do you want God's blessing on your marriage? You're going to say yes, I want God's blessing on her. I want God's blessing in my home. I want God's blessing on my children. But 
that you have a lot to do with it. God will do his part if we do our part. But we've got to do our part. And then his part will function. Second Samuel 6, 9 and 11. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not
he as an Israelite, he was not supposed to touch it. And so he falls dead yeah. on the spot. God killed him dead on the spot. Because he did what he knew he should do, even though he thought it was for a good cause. So David gets angry. He does. Because the man was a good man. And he was trying to do something good. And David gets angry and he gets afraid at the same time. So he says, we're going to stop right here. Okay, let's get a good man that's got a good testimony. And this ark is going to go into Obed's Edom's house. And then I'm going to go back. And I'm going to pray. And I'm going to get a hold of God. And I'm going to figure out this whole thing. Because he was upset. He was angry and afraid. And while the ark of the covenant was at Obed Edom's house, because Obed Edom was a very uh, godly man, having the ark in their home, he took it as a great honor and a great privilege. Oh my goodness, I have the ark of the covenant in my home. And I'm sure that it was just the center of the attention of the whole family. And he probably had that In our house. This is this is Jehovah God of the Old Testament. And we've got him in our house. We've got to, we've got to treat this right. We've got to do right by this. And the Bible says that every day for three months, I'm sure that, that well, that they lived in awareness that God was living with them. And we need this awareness. We need this awareness. Every time we open up our eyes, as soon as we wake up, we need the awareness to know. That God is with us. That God is walking with us. He's looking at us. He's right there. And while the Ark of the Covenant was in Obed Edom's house, there was great blessing to that home. Because he knew how to handle the things of God. story to you. I stopped because I was debating and looking at the time. But we have time. And I'm not going to meddle. But I guess I am going to meddle. To say that too many homes also have a box that is the focal point of their home. towards it. Let me read you a little story. It's titled The Stranger. A few months after I was born, my dad he met a stranger who was new in our small town. From the beginning, dad was fascinated with this enchanting newcomer. And he soon invited him to live with our family. The stranger was quickly accepted and was welcomed quite easily around town. As I grew up, I never questioned his place in our family. Mom taught me to love the Word of God and Dad taught me to obey it. But the stranger was our storyteller. He would weave the most fascinating tales, adventures, and mysteries and comedies were daily conversation. He could hold our whole family spellbound for hours each evening. He was like a friend to the whole family. He took Dad, Bill, and me to our first Major League Baseball game. And he was always encouraging us to see movies. And even made arrangements to introduce us to several movie stars. The stranger was an incessant talker. Dad didn't seem to mind. But sometimes Mom... She would quietly get up while the rest of us were enthralled with one of his stories of faraway places. And she would leave the room and go to her bedroom, read her Bible, and pray. I wonder how, I wonder now if she ever prayed that the stranger would leave. You see, my dad ruled our household with certain moral convictions. But this stranger never felt an obligation to honor them. Profanity, for example, was not allowed in our house, not from us, from our friends or any adults that came to our house. But our long-time visitor used occasional four-letter words that burned my ears and my dad's burned. To my knowledge, the stranger was never confronted. My dad wasn't a teetotaler. He didn't permit alcohol in his home. Not even for cooking. But the stranger felt like we needed exposure and enlightenment 
to other ways of life. He offered us beer and other alcoholic beverages often. He made cigarettes look really tasty, cigars looked real manly, and pipes looked distinguished. He talked freely, in fact, too freely, about sex. His comments were sometimes blatant, sometimes suggestive, and always pretty embarrassing. I now, now I know now that my early concepts of the man-woman relationship were very wrongly influenced by the stranger. And as I look back, I believe it was the grace of God that the stranger did not influence us more. I really think Mother was praying for us. As time after time, he opposed the values of my parents, yet was seldom rebuked and never asked to leave. More than 30 years have passed since the stranger moved in with our family on Morningside Drive. But if I were to walk into my parents' living room today, you would still see him sitting over there in a corner, waiting for someone to listen to him talk and watch him draw his pictures. His name, you ask? Oh, we just always call him TV. The box in the center of Obed Edom's house brought blessing. And it reminded them daily of God's presence and of his goodness, his faithfulness, his promises, his covenant with man, with Abraham. It brought into their home God's power and God's glory. And too often, our homes and our thoughts are shaped. Our home life is shaped. Our children's minds are being influenced, corrupted even. Our values are being chipped away at. And our healthy relationships are being disturbed. And our thoughts are being occupied by too much media. I've got to say it because it's the truth. Yeah, it's the truth. But in that box that was in Obed Edom's house, inside that ark, there were three things. The two stone tablets of the law given to Moses, and you may stand. God's word in our home. That's what that represents. The two stone tablets that were given by God, which was the law that was given to Moses. That's God's word in our home. In our homes, with our kids, as husband and wife, we ought to talk. It should be common that we have conversations about the Lord. This is healthy to share. Oh, oh, what happened on Sunday? Did you see what God did on Sunday? Wasn't that great? Or when you receive a blessing, speak it openly before your children. God, we were needing, we had a need, but no kids. God, he's a man of need. This should be in our conversation all the time. The word of God in our homes, thanksgiving unto God. Not just if you still pray and give thanks at the table before you eat, I hope. are chipping away at our values. And if we don't make a conscious decision, we're going to keep losing stuff. I made up my mind, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But see, I can, I can make that decision. Me and my husband can make it for our home. We cannot make it for yours. Every mother and every father, every husband and every wife, you together, you got to get on the same page. And you've got to make up your mind. God is going to be the center of our home, of our marriage, of our relationship, 
of our relationship with our children, God is going to be the center. The jar of manna was all from Israel's days in the wilderness was also in the ark. And Aaron's budding staff. The manna represents God's provision for our families, for our homes. And Aaron's budding staff represents God's ordained leadership in our homes. We need men that get a hold of God to lead their families, to protect their families, to protect their wife. This is what God made you for, man. He made you to be the covering over your wife and your children. And so you must get a hold of God. And women, we are to be the homemaker. We are the heart of the home. We are to be in subjection to our husbands, in obedience, and live in harmony with them. Get on the same page. But husband, we've got to seek you. Seeking God. And living for God. To really be able to respect you. A husband many times will try to demand the respect of his wife. But his wife lives with him. He knows. She knows. But nobody else knows what kind of man he is. And many times the wife finds it so difficult to respect her husband because he makes it difficult for her. But wives, mothers, we also must keep our place because we love God and we want to obey Him and we want to please Him. So don't harp at your husband. Pray for him. Pray that God would make him the man that God wants him to be. And husband, pray for your wife. You are. God made it to be that you would be the spiritual protector for her. That you would be the one to face the hard things of, of, of life so that she wouldn't have to. We need to learn to build an altar to God in our home. Let your children hear you pray. Let your children hear you. Because one day, if the Lord tarries, and you are no longer on this, on this earth, and your, your child is going to be a grown adult, and they're, gonna be, they're not going to be able to pick up the phone, Mom, Mom, what do I do? Mom, pray for me. Mom, Dad, Dad, pray for me. I'm really going through a hard time. You're not going to be there. I'm not going to be there. And God's going to bring to their memory yes. how they used to hear their dad pray. And how they used to hear their dad call out to God. And how they used to hear mom call out their name. Oh God, protect my children. Yes. And then they're going to know, I know where I can go. Mom and dad are not here. I can't talk to them. But I can talk to God. He will let me know what I have to do. We've got to leave, leave our children a spiritual heritage. If there is no houses for me to leave to my children, if there is no money that I ever can leave to my children, if there is no earthly riches that I would have to leave to my children, I can leave them a spiritual heritage, a pattern by which they can follow because they saw their mother and they saw their father walk with God and be faithful to God and seek God. Then I can leave this earth and know my kids, when they have their problems, they're going to know who to go to. They're going to know how to serve God because they saw their mom and dad serve God the right way. And God will be with them. 
I want to open up this altar this morning. The choices that you make today as a mother, the choices you make today as a father, or in the future when God gives you children, you're choosing not only for yourself, remember this, you are choosing for the future of your children. It's a heavy thought, but you are choosing for the future of your children. If you choose and strive to live a life close to God, you are also choosing for your children. That is not a guarantee that they will not make their own mistakes and maybe even leave God for a while. But there will be that hope that because you set the right example and you set the right pattern, one day God will draw them back. And when they come back, they will know how to truly serve God and seek God and walk with God and talk with God and serve God. So the choice that you make today is not just for you. You are choosing for your future generations if God tells. The presence of the Lord is here with us. that is close to the heart of God. And God is very interested in your home, in your marital relationship, in the relationship with your children. And I ask these men of God that are here this 